Market Day is a special day on the rural coast of Ecuador. In the nearby town of Hama, just up the hill, our Ecuadorian friend and helper, Primo, starts up the engine on his moto taxi, a motorcycle with a bright red open cab attached, to begin his work of transporting people and groceries as very few have cars, including me. I am his first customer of the day. Primo is short and stocky and strong. He has impeccable manners and a smile that proudly displays a number of silver teeth. Primo's lanky 12-year-old nephew, Jose, rides along in the cab. This is good. Primo lost his own little boy to an illness a year ago. So the nephew's presence during the school-free months no doubt helps with his grief. Every Tuesday morning, uncle and nephew motor down the winding hill to the tiny fishing village of El Matal. This is where I live. They collect me at the door of my casa with my empty shopping bags, and off we go, the red moto taxi climbing happily back up the hill to the brightly colored fruits and vegetables that await me in Hama. It is a four-mile journey of bliss. The air is sweet and warm. The breeze exquisite. We wind through lush tropical farmland where whole families of lazy cows wander at will. We pass shrimp ponds dotted with snowy egrets, their languorous angelic wings flapping as if in slow motion against misty blue mountains in the distance. It is enough to make the heart full. Jose, my young riding companion, has warm brown skin, delicate features, and thick longish hair. He sits in the front seat of his uncle's cab while I sit behind where there is more leg room. For the 15 minute journey, Jose and I casually teach each other words from our own languages, but Jose does most of the teaching. He points to the snowy egrets and says, Ave Blanca, white bird, and I repeat it back. Then we pass grazing cows on the hillside, and I learn bacas, cows. Jose laughs at my accent. We both do, as I am new at this language game. When we arrive in Hama, Jose and I climb down from the moto taxi near the fresh vegetable stand on the street. Jose points out vegetables and fruits, naming them in Spanish and making sure the vendor does her job efficiently, and more importantly, that I am not overcharged. We cross the street. Other moto taxis whiz by, and Jose puts out an arm to stop me from stepping out in front of them. I buy Jose a Coca-Cola, and he accepts it with a smile and a shy gracias. He carries the overflowing produce bag back to the moto taxi, and off we go to the mom and pop store for stables. Despite his skinny frame, Jose carries everything himself, no matter how heavy. He insists. We have a system, Jose and I, a relationship, a way of doing things and it feels good. One day, the moto taxi pulls up to my home, but Jose is missing. Primo has brought his wife, Margarita, instead, and they both look distressed, as if something is wrong. I naturally ask about Jose, and they take turns, speaking fast and furiously with dramatic gesturing. The only word I actually understand is Jose. Something about Jose. Something is wrong with Jose. But nothing could possibly be wrong with Jose, I tell myself, or at least nothing serious. He's a healthy 12-year-old full of life and energy and curiosity, so I interpret their incomprehensible Spanish and wild gesturing in my own preferred way. Jose has had some kind of accident and has broken something, that's all. It saddens me to think of it, but boys do that. They break bones. It happens. I offer a heartfelt lo siento as I climb aboard the moto taxi and vow inwardly to spend more time on my Spanish. In Hama, I ask Primo to stop at a little shop that carries games for children. I purchase a bingo game, but when I take the game back to the moto taxi and hand it to Primo with the words para Jose, Primo's expressive face suddenly freezes, the game stranded awkwardly between us. He glances at his wife as if for help. Margarita gently takes the game and tucks it under the seat of the motor taxi out of sight. We move on. A stab of fear shoots through me. Could Jose be that bad off? I brush the thought away, thinking that I must have made a cultural faux pas. 
Yes, that's it. Perhaps you can't give presents like this. One week later, the red moto taxi appears at my door, this time with a grown man as passenger. Primo introduces him as Jose's papa. I ask, Como esta Jose? Again, I get a puzzled, frozen look from Primo, and now the same from the father. This is too much. I throw my arms out in a pleading gesture and cry, No, entiendo. I don't understand. My rigid denial, hiding behind a huge language barrier, begins to wobble. Primo keeps talking, this time more slowly. I finally catch a word, a word I understand, but oh, how I wish I did not understand. The word is muerto, dead. I repeat it back in disbelief, and Primo slowly nods. My hand flies to my heart as I take a step back. No, I say. No. I pull out my cell phone and call a translator. The translator talks to Primo, and then I take the phone, my hands shaking. The sober voice of the translator confirms that the boy was killed over a week ago in a tragic accident. Jose is dead. He has been dead all this time. Primo and Jose's papa try to comfort me, this overwrought gringa, slow on the uptake, while they are suffering grief beyond my imagination. In robotic fashion, I climb aboard. They came all the way from Hama. I cannot disappoint. We trundle up the hill in the red moto taxi, now a sorrowful moto taxi, a ponderous conveyance bearing the heavy weight of our grief. The three of us, silently united by this terrible knowledge. When we reach the tienda where I buy my eggs and staples, I feel disoriented and dizzy by the crowd, so many customers and too many voices, loud and cheerful. I squat down to the low shelf where the brown eggs are lined up in neat rows. I place each egg carefully into my own cardboard carton, one by one, until I have a full dozen. I rise and turn, trembling with thoughts of a little boy who loves snowy egrets and cows and school-free days and who laughed at my funny accent. Suddenly, I realize that the carton of eggs is no longer in my hands, but on the floor, the entire dozen broken and yellow and running into the dusty grout like rivers of sorrow. I stand immobile, transfixed, watching the spread of waste, noting the odd contours of brokenness through irrepressible tears. The store owner appears with a broom and a smile of reassurance. She cannot understand my weeping over broken eggs, and I cannot explain it. On the way home, I gather myself, remembering my companions who sit stoically in front of me. Here is Primo, who has lost not only his son one year ago, but now his nephew. I think of Jose's papa, who rides along with his brother-in-law, not saying much, just rides along, Maybe, I think, because the driver knows his pain from the inside. He is in the presence of a fellow sufferer who understands. In the silence, it dawns on me that I might at least say something of comfort to the father. Using what little Spanish I can muster, my mind flounders for a word, anything, however inadequate. Then I remember a vocabulary word I recently learned, cielo, heaven. I say, Jose está en cielo. Jose is in heaven. Jose's papa offers a single nod. His stoic face softens. A flash of something appears in the dark wells of his eyes. Cielo, he echoes, his tone reverential. Primo, listening from the driver's seat, turns back and says, as if it were a benediction, Cielo, si, cielo. The musical sound of the word cielo, spoken aloud by each of us, adds a tender element to the air, to the scenery, to the ache itself. A profound respect for my traveling companions wells up inside me. I observe Primo as he drives with his usual care, quiet, composed, focused on his task. Jose's papa gazes thoughtfully out at the hills, 
the banana plants, and the young papaya trees. I think to myself, heaven holds them together. Heaven makes daily work possible. Heaven keeps the molecules of their bodies from flying apart. As the motor taxi winds back down through the verdant landscape, alive with the same beauty that welcomed us when Jose was alive, we pass the snowy white egrets with their enormous graceful wings. We pass the quiet shrimp ponds that mirror softly shaped hills. We pass the lumbering cows, a baby calf nursing, and I feel the heart of the whole world breaking. It breaks over the beauty. It breaks under the sky. It breaks into rivers of sorrow and hope. It breaks clear through the paper wall that separates heaven and earth.